Welcome, everybody. This is another segment of the AOA podcast, part of the Early Surgeon series. And this episode, we're going to be talking about the boards. So trying to discuss the boards, talk about kind of some of the, the do's and don'ts, and, and really just kind of discuss them. And it'll probably be a little bit of catharsis for us as well, just to be able to chat about them. So hopefully this will be helpful for everybody. I've got two recent passers, if you will, or ABOS delegates, I guess that's what they call us, I'm with me today. Dr. Anthony Catanzano, he is from Duke, pediatric spine, neuromuscular, kind of everything type surgeon, and happens to be a med school roommate of mine. Thanks for joining us. And then my partner, Erin Honchurik, she is a pediatric deformity surgeon here at Johns Hopkins, and I welcome both of you here today. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. Oh, yeah. No, I appreciate your time. No. Well, thanks for coming on. Again, we probably all talk to each other plenty about this stuff, but I want to kind of touch on a few things or a few kind of tips and tricks and things like that. But really, can we just start with, give me your kind of overview of the process and kind of how you felt going through it when you were done, kind of your overall feel after it was over. Well, I can say that I hated the entire process so if you are one of those people, it is totally fine. I got through it and I did fine. I hated the preparation for it. I hated the time it took away from my actual current patient care. I hated the actual day and I hated waiting for the results. But, you know, I had a lot of support both before and after that I found really helpful and I can talk about that. I mean, obviously passing felt significant relief at that point, but it, it was really, really stressful for me. And I think that's very common to have those feelings. No, yeah. I think if you don't mind, before we get to Anthony, can you just go into kind of what you hated about it? I, I think that <laughs> yeah. you're kind of hitting me right off the, the, the gate and taking away yeah. the, <laughs> the, uh, side of it. But uh, yeah, give me your thoughts. Yeah, I just, I felt very judgmental, but in a very superficial judgmental way, where I didn't really feel like I could maybe be judged on the type of surgeon and doctor and person that I am, which may be unfair. Maybe they they are getting a really good sense of what we're like. That was just sort of my opinion on the other side of it. And again, like I just felt like it was taking a lot of time from my ability to care for my actual patients advice that was given to me that I pass on, especially as someone who also had a young son during this process, is I actually took a week off of work just to do the paperwork. And I felt that that was really, really helpful. But that was also a, a week away from work and being able to see patients and be in the operating room. But I didn't really see with kind of the how the rest of my life works, there was really any other way to do it. That's great. Yeah, thanks for that. Anthony, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, it's it's certainly a stressful process. I don't think anyone will tell you differently. You know, I think some of the things as I was going through it that I really disliked was that I do feel like you, I feel like you alter the way you practice, or at least you think, you know, you're always constantly thinking, am I doing this right? Am I, you're, you're kind of second guessing yourself and then you're worrying about your notes and you're thinking to yourself, oh, should I include this? Because this is a boards patient. And, you know, I think, you know, at the, at the base of all this, it should really be assessing how we practice medicine naturally. Um, so I, that was a little bit stressful for me. And looking back, I wish that I hadn't thought, because honestly, I think in all the training that we've gone through in our residencies and fellowships, I think we know, you know, good documentation. We know good decision-making you know, there's no need to really alter that. If you if you prepared like that throughout your training, you should be uh, in a good position to just continue those habits. I think one thing for sure that it actually did get me to do was ask for help and reach out to partners, you know, within my institution and also, you know, former fellowship mentors when you have something that can go either way. I mean, we, the three of us live in the peds world. I think you can show... You can show anyone an x-ray and you'd have, you know, if you showed 10 people, you'd have 10 different ways to treat a fracture. And so I think just it made me reach out to get support to, you know, 
I think at the time it's sometimes to solidify your own thinking, but there are certainly cases where things can go either way. And I think it, it really pushes you to do that. And I would, I would really recommend that to folks. And then, you know, obviously I think from a documentation standpoint, like I said, practice as you're going to practice medicine uh, and develop good habits. And also so that when you, you know, I think the other thing you don't realize is these cases come back several, several months later. And so as you're going back and preparing, you want to make sure you have good documentation, not for the reviewer, you're doing this for you and for your patients. So you want to make sure you have good documentation so that you can remember that as you prep. But I, I, I think for me, those were the most stressful things were, you know, thinking I had to practice some ABOS way. And, you know, there are no guidelines to that you just need to do what's best for patients, you need to, you know, make sure that you're uh, addressing all the issues head to toe and, and putting it in the chart, it should it should be a, a process that, you know, helps build those habits. Yeah, I'll be a little bit counter. I, I, I agree 100% with everything that you guys said. And I, I obviously, um, Aaron and I, we kind of went through it together from that standpoint. But I, I felt like I tried my best not to alter how I was doing things. I, I really went into it a little bit. I, I think defensive is probably the best way to to think about it. When I started that that collection period, I had already kind of made my documentation a certain way to where I was very thorough with my summaries. I like really kind of talked out my thoughts and really went through it step by step. And I, I continue to do that to today. So it was something I actually found very valuable. Just talk it out, like, like make it part of your documentation. First of all, like as you're just starting practice, it's, you need to be doing that anyway. I feel like my anxiety level was already high just getting going and questioning myself. And, and I did use partners. I did ask questions constantly and that's something you can document. And that, and that's a, a very positive thing. So, so you're not out there doing things on your own. I think the best advice that I got that kind of led me into this whole process was they're not trying to fail you. I think I just had to go back and keep remembering that little bit of information. And then I just went back and said, I, I am a good doctor. I've went through this before. I just need to think through and make sure I'm not missing stuff. So I felt like that didn't change. And so, yes, it was grueling and time intensive. I think the process itself is really will drain you. But that's the one thing I, I would say that I felt like worked well is just the documentation. I, I took the time and I still to this day uh, uh, do that. I have a big summary statement at the top. People may not like to read it, but it helps me even because I feel like the Aaron two months ago is not thinking the exact same as the Aaron today. So just for my own clinical benefit. So I could not agree more. It is, it, it's tough. I don't want to downplay that, but I do think that that was the advice I got. And I it felt like that was true. It's they're not trying to fail you. They're trying to make sure you're safe. So be a safe surgeon. So thanks for that. Any, any other last bits there? I think documentation is an easy segue any kind of things that you did that you or or didn't do that you wish you did early in the process. I think they're a little bit late as far as their collection time. And I apologize for that, everybody, but things to do to make, make that process easier. Yeah. I think one thing is um, one thing I didn't realize, like I said, it may be a little late for this, but just uh, you, you have to redact all the identifying data, including the name. So like when you, make a note and you say, you know, Aaron Brandt is a 15 year old boy with just say he or she or they or them use pronouns because you don't have to redact those. So I definitely found myself, there are some notes where I just use the person's name over and over again. I had to go through and redact all those. So just from a, like a, a practical purpose, it's uh, better to use pronouns in those notes to minimize how much redacting you need to do. I think at the stage that you all will be at, where you're kind of adding documentation to the website. Um, there are guidelines. Make sure you go over those guidelines thoroughly because things like, you know, daily PT notes, I don't think are necessarily required unless I think they, they give clear kind of instructions, like unless it changes care in some way, a lot of the documentation that you may think you have to be copy and pasting and including, you may not have to. So I think really make sure that you read those instructions and include the necessary information. The flip side to that is if you think there is something in there that affected your decision-making that is supportive of what you did, it kind of paints a better picture. Uh, I think including it is, is really important. 
because a, like I said before, it's going to help you as you prepare those few weeks beforehand. And also it does help kind of paint a picture for the reviewers. And then I think really the, the biggest important, the most important thing I realized after was that those reviewers do not see that documentation until you sit down in the room. So it's not like they have, you know, combed over all of your documentation you know, with a fine tooth comb before that. So they sit down with you and they kind of are going through the documentation. So they're not looking for grammatical errors. They're not looking for, you know, minute details and misspellings, things like that. They're really looking for big picture things. They're going to go through, they're going to look at a physical exam. They're going to look at, you know, lab testing and things like that, that you've included, but it is not like a board examiner is reading pages one through a thousand of everything that you've submitted, you know, letter by letter. Another option for documentation, if you don't want to do all the redacting, is you can have patients sign the, it's like a waiver, or I forget exactly what it's called. And I actually did that for a lot of patients. It feels a little awkward initially because you're like, oh, I'm being evaluated. And so sometimes I think a lot of people would worry that patients would lose confidence in you. But I just kind of got in the habit of just doing it. And it was really natural. I didn't have any issues, you know, especially in peds, you worry that patients, you know, it's the parents and they're going to be really overbearing and, and there were really no issues at all. And you could either do it before the surgery or I did it after the surgeries. There were some patients where I had difficulty with follow-up or particularly with trauma. You can't really do it before. And, and so there were some that I had to redact and I used a PDF or Adobe program where I would control find and look for patients' names. And, and that was sort of how I would go through. And that was a good way to kind of quickly go through um, your notes and make sure that you're finding their names as well. Yeah. I, I think the, both of those, that's kind of, I did uh, similar with both, both approaches. I didn't do any of the uh, documentation or like having them sign. That was just another thing to me. So I, I didn't do that. But I was kind of careful with the the names and things like that. And I was pretty consistent with my notes. So even when I went back to redact, I used Outlook. I literally just did the black highlighter and went through and and removed stuff. And like it was three or four things per per note. It didn't, it wasn't too bad from that perspective. So again, just kind of preparing your notes in a way that will limit how often that happens and then kind of keep it, keep the identifiers to a minimum. That's, if I can add one thing, you know, yeah. we're the three of us are academic surgeons. So for those of uh, those in private practice that may have administrative assistants and others, you know, working within their office, I, I had some friends that were in a situation like that and they had their staff do the redacting. You know, I would just make sure you're checking everything. This is, you know, this is really determining, you know, the next step in your career. And so while that may be super helpful, you know, to get that going, you still want to make sure you're checking everything and not just submitting you know, redaction that, that other, you know, someone else may have done. Yeah. And the other, the other thing I'd say is, and this is just another point of anxiety is the little details that you miss, like the typos, those, those little mistakes. I, I, I truly believe, and I can't say this for, for sure, but I, I don't think that they're going to be like, take away from your day, you know, like, so they're not looking for those little type, they're not going to give you like a, a spell check and say like, oh, he doesn't pass because he didn't spell this right. Um, so you're doing your best. I had one that was like a really blatant typo on a note and I didn't, I see it until I was reviewing the day on the, on the morning of, and I was like, oh, here we go. It, it, but at that point there was nothing I could do about it. So I think from that perspective, just try not to like let that type of stuff shade your ability to perform. It's, it's, it's documentation do do it do be safe do the right thing from that perspective but again develop the safeguards that prevent you from making mistakes and so i think using pronouns is a pretty pretty simple uh, way to do it and then the redaction process for those of you who had someone do it for you congrats i hate you but it, it's not too bad either it's just going and finding them and removing the the data yeah i think that was one thing i wanted to highlight is just ways to kind of limit your time kind of on the back end and uh, you guys kind of hit it on the head there. I think the pre-documentation is huge. One one other thing that I did, uh, and there's a, a whole bunch of ways to do this. I did this with just a little notebook that I could carry with me. Other people have Excel sheets. 
but I, I would have sort of like a half a page for each patient and I would have their name, sort of information, the surgery that they had and my planned follow-up things that happened. And then in the, the very front of the notebook, I had the, the list of complications or things that you have to document for the boards. And so it was a good reminder of like, oh, okay, right. I have to document that that's a complication for this, or I have to make sure that that's involved. And once a week, I would kind of flip through it. And I had little boxes of they're supposed to follow up in six weeks. And if I realized that that six weeks had passed, then I would have my team reach out to them and try to bring them in. Because that's a big thing too, that I, I think the boards is looking for, that you are actively you know, trying to make sure that patients aren't allowed to disappear. And so I really tried to stay on top of that process and making sure that they, they were coming back or that we were at least documenting that we were attempting to, to find these patients. And that was a good way just to, instead of waiting until the end, just kind of slowly keeping up you know, it's a little bit easier if you kind of look once a week versus at the end and you're like, oh, shoot, I haven't seen this patient and I operated on them at the start of collection. Yeah, I did uh, the Excel file and it was super helpful because I had one of the columns was like next scheduled post-op appointment. So I was able to, you know, every couple of weeks, you know, as you're you're loading cases onto there weekly. So I would just be able to check and say, oh, those this date has passed. So, you know, that's a patient that I need to make sure. I reach out to. And I think that's that's come up with a couple of my younger partners kind of going through it now. And some friends as we were going through it was like, what do you do in that situation? So what I did was, you know, I made sure that the scheduler, you know, typically if we have just the way our clinic works, if the patient no shows our, you know, nurse or MA will reach out to contact the patient to see if they're, you know, if they pick up, if they're able to come in later that day or to, you know, reschedule the appointment. And so if they were unable to contact them, I had them put a note into the chart saying, you know, patient was reached at the listed numbers, you know, unable to contact them. And then we have a social worker in clinic. And so I just, you know, at the beginning of the process kind of said, hey, Gina, I'm going to need some help with some of these, you know, patients to make sure we're tracking them down. So again, every couple of weeks or months as you know, they missed the second appointment, then I would have our social worker just make sure that we were you know, had good documentation that we reached out, make sure that we had good numbers, good emails, things like that. I've heard of other places where they're like, they'll like the institution will send like a certified letter or things of that nature. And I heard that was actually frowned upon by the ABOS. So I don't think you need to go too wild on trying to track people down. I think just making the effort, documenting that you've made the effort is the most important thing, but you got to keep that list so that you know who it is you have to look out for. Yeah, the documentation is huge. I, I think you guys are hitting it right there. Like that, you want to just do the things that you would do clinically normally. I, so if you discharge a patient after two months because they're doing well, you don't have to call, call them back in to come and check again. That was your plan of care. I think those pieces were always question marks. Me is like, ooh, man, I haven't seen this person in four months. But I said PRN. So you don't have to alter your course. Even the uh, the P rounds are like kind of the the follow up that they'll send to them with the email and things like that. If they don't respond from the email, it's it not going to change kind of what your plan was from that perspective. So, again, do what you would normally do, document appropriately, and 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 you'll be and you'll be good. I did the Excel as well, and I'm not as Type A, and I I needed that, and I was not as good as Aaron or you. It sounds like documenting and putting these in. I was good for about a month. And then at the very end, I just had to input them all, which was not very di difficult in all honesty. It did not take a crazy amount of time. I think the the redacting and the building of your little set after you get your 12 that they choose, that's that's what really kind of takes the cake. That's what really gets hard. But time time intensive, hard is a relative term. Let's do the the day itself. Um, I, I don't know what you guys felt about the, the day itself, but what did you think about kind of the environment, kind of the the process? If I can step back real quick, because I, I feel like this is prep for the day, but it wasn't day of. Yeah. Um, so I I did a run. I actually did two run throughs with uh, one of my mentors, John Birch. And so you can do this with anyone. He used to 
be an evaluator for the board. So he had a little bit of insight. So that was nice. But I did it with him right after my case selection. So before I even did any of the documentation, just of what should I be thinking about these cases? And then actually after I had submitted all of my cases. So I think we actually did it on July 4th. I took the boards July 19th, I think. So, you know, my, my, all, both of our schedules were crazy. July 4th was the one day that worked and he is an incredible man to spend his holiday. I think we spent four or five hours literally going through each of my cases and I would pretend like I was presenting them. He asked a ton of questions. I wrote down a ton of notes and, um, that made me feel significantly better going into the actual day. And so if that's someone that you have available, I did that also with one of my co-fellows. We kind of just ran through our cases together. I know that a lot of different societies think RJOS has that as an option. So if that's something that you want to take advantage of, lots of ways to do sort of these um, fake board days. Yeah, I think that's really critical. I, I did the same. I I think um, for one, certainly reach out to senior partners. Even like I, I felt a lot of, uh, I got a lot of benefit. One of my partners is just a year or two ahead of me. And I felt like she was really able to give me, like she gave me a lot of pointers just on like little things that I like wouldn't have thought of. So, you know, for instance, you know, saying very, very commonly when we're presenting cases and board and stuff, we say, you know, we, you know, we approached, uh, we did an anterior approach and it's, it should be I, you know, say I, I did an anterior approach, you know, also in like the information that you put out there, right? Like you are there to report your case and to describe your case. They can ask, they should bring up questions. I had a spondy on mine and in prepping, I had all this thing about why I did a posterior lateral fusion and not like an A-lift or a T-lift. And, you know, she was like, don't, don't give them that, you know, just say what you did. You did a posterior lateral fusion with iliac crest bone graft. Let them ask, you know, why, why did you not do an inner body in this case? And, and then you can kind of explain there. So I think, you know, from folks that have kind of gone through it really recently, I think that's helpful. And then, you know, from some of the, you know, more seasoned uh, mentors that we all have through fellowship, like reach out to your fellowship program, your residency program. There's certain uh, to be folks that are be willing to help and kind of do these mock exams with you. And it's just really helpful for you to get your presentation down and get your presentation sharp. And then kind of like Aaron said, kind of understand like questions to expect. You're, you're not going to get nearly as many questions as you get on these mock exams because you only have 10 minutes of time in each section. But I, I found them to be extraordinarily helpful. And I, 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 was re- I actually reached out to people and just said, hey, would you mind doing a mock exam with me? And I, I didn't get one no. So reach out to, you know, I think fellowship mentors are probably used to it. Anyone in academic medicine is probably used to these things. And then again, everyone's gone through it in the ABOS to, to be a, uh, a delegate. So, you know, reach out and, and do that. So I think that's a huge prep item. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. That, that's that I, I agree 100%. That's something that absolutely changes the day for you. If you have kind of gone through that process and, and uh, had someone quiz you and test you and Anthony, that's spot on. Like, don't talk the whole time. Like, honestly, I felt like the examiners don't want to hear that either. They want to have questions to ask you. And if you are constantly just throwing out stuff, it takes away from their experience too, because they're volunteering to come and do this as well. And so that was kind of my, that my banter, I did one or two with, uh, with, uh, some, one of my upper levels, just a couple years ahead. I wanted someone who was fresh from the process as well. And who was also going to mess with me a little bit. And we went through a few, but by the time you are on that day, you have exhausted these cases and you know, these front to back, you know them better than anybody who could possibly sit in front of you. You know, the family, like that was the other thing. I just, I went into it. I'm like, I know these people, these are my patients. These are my, these are, these are my kids or my adults. I had a bunch of uh, adult stuff on there too, but just don't, don't forget that. I think that you have put in a lot for these. And if you took good care of these, these patients, then you'll be ready, but it is nice to go through them and find someone to to test you a little bit, at least so that you know how it kind of the flow is for you. And Aaron, I think I saw you chime in. Anything to add? Yeah, the other thing I would say I did is, so my my other advice is to get to Chicago two days before your your day for a couple of reasons. 
one, we had a couple people our year that missed their boards because of flight issues, and they are not lenient about that. And two, you know, I just felt comfortable. I got there, you know, two days before. And then the day before, I literally just sat in my hotel room and I just went through my cases. You know, I took some time, went to the gym, kind of relaxed, and then went back and just went through those cases. So I just knew my spiel. I knew what the x-rays were going to look like. I had my articles that I was ready to reference if needed. And so again, like as Aaron is saying, you're just so well rehearsed that anything that maybe throws you off, you're kind of ready for it. Yeah, because I think that's that's a great point in that, you know, if you're going through your case and a question comes in, you answer that question like you you know these cases so well, you just go right back to the script. You know, what I mean, like, you know where you left off and where to pick up again. So I think in like preparing for that day, you know, just. Just like you, just like we did as interns at Trauma Board for the first time when we had to present that patient, we wanted to have that presentation tight. Like it's the same thing. You want a tight presentation, the relevant details in a cohesive kind of coherent manner, and you want to know it well enough that you can stop and start kind of throughout it. Definitely get there two days before. Uh, I would also throw in there, stay a day after, meet up with some friends, you know, celebrate for 24 hours. I took a flight back like the evening of and had clinic had a cerebral palsy clinic the next day. So I never really got the the time to decompress. I would two days before take a day after enjoy it. I, I think it can be really stressful. There's like everyone in this hotel is an ortho orthopedic surgeon. And so I don't know, I get a lot of anxiety seeing other folks because I worry like, Oh, that person's so much more cool, calm and collected than I am before this test that, you know, when you're, you know, sitting at the restaurant or getting a bite to eat or something at the, at the hotel. So I try, I, I too kind of spent a lot of time in my room, went out to, you know, go for a run or work out, but otherwise, you know, I kind of kept to myself, but I think that's to each, to each his own, whatever, whatever kind of brings you kind of um, calm and, and relaxation. I think go ahead and do that. Yeah, no, there's no right way to do this. I think that that's one thing about the resources that were provided is I, they just seem so structured and formal. Like there was just one rubric and that was the only way to kind of go about this. And you do have to kind of go through the process and have the stuff, the documentation and everything, have your consents, like all those little things. But in the end, it's still your cases. And, and uh, so how you present them is, is yours. Like, I, I think that that's something that can potentially give a little bit less anxiety is just uh, having a little bit of ownership there. I, I, I call it eight miling in honor of Eminem, but I just try to think like, what are they going to mess with me about? Like, like what, what could they ask and, and how do I get them there? Cause I'm ready. So that was kind of my prep. I agree. Like I just kind of stuck in a lot of like, it's an anxiety provoking process and like no one's there drinking the night before, like everyone's there with the same, the same feeling. It's really kind of a weird environment. And so I agree. An extra day before or after for many reasons would be good. I, I, I remember I just drove around after after I was done just to kind of decompress, look around Chicago and and go from there. But take some time. Yeah. I, I don't know if like we need to spend too much time on the rooms. They have a pretty good kind of mock interview that is pretty accurate. I guess anything that you would take away from the the sessions themselves other than the buzz there. So these are not rooms, by the way, everyone, these are like cloth curtains that separate everybody. And somehow they keep the sound like relatively down, but you can still hear it. Once it starts going, the buzz is the the Everyone's talking and it's, it's pretty chaotic. It's kind of honestly kind of cool. So I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah. I think you're, you're in that, you're on one side of the table. I think one thing is you have your laptop, uh, you have a laptop in front of you with your cases filled up. I think just to plug, you know, the forms that you, the kind of case forms that you have to fill out, the examples they give you, they, they put very little in them. I found, I actually think the example case is like an AIS case and it was just, you know, very little tidbits. I put as much as I could in those forms more for me than for the examiner. Like I put that in so that, cause you have that form in front of you. So I put as many details as I could fit in the, in the allotted uh, space so that I, you know, had a little bit of a script that I could follow. And like we talked about before, if I was off script, I can kind of find myself and get back. So I use that form a lot and you'll have your, you'll have the laptop with that in front of you. 
the images up on the screen to the left. Just they have a lot of good videos on kind of how that will work on test day and just get you know comfortable and familiar. You do have a little bit of time, a couple minutes in between the examiners changing rooms because you'll stay in the same quote unquote room the whole time. So you can make sure you get the next set of x-rays up and kind of play around with them before they come in to make sure it's all smooth. And then, like I said, two of them, two of them come in and sit across from you. I found that I felt like one of the examiners was very kind of into your documentation, kind of scrolling through while the other kind of started the the questioning. And, uh, and yeah, I think, um, I, I think, as long as you're kind of familiar with the software, you'll, you'll be good on that end. Yeah, and the, the outline or the, the form that uh, Anthony's bring, talking about is that is what you will jot notes down for your final submissions. So don't think that this is some some uh, like nebulous thing that's that you have to get, do on the day of. It's actually a, something that you'll do prior. And, and you can put little di like bullet points outline kind of form. But yeah, that's a great way to kind of just put down what you need to get the details right. I thought that was very helpful as well. And then my only advice for that room, what he was describing, I did, I got my document, like, like my next slides up, but I got up and walked. I like, don't sit there for all 12, you know, like get up, move, like do what you need to do. I think I stood up and stretched as someone was coming in and they laughed at me, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, I couldn't just sit there. So um, get up and move, drink some water, whatever you need to do. Yeah, I would agree. And, you know, we, we talked about that there's going to be lots of questions, but I think just be ready. Like, I think I said five words and I got a question in my first presentation. So that kind of threw me off a little bit. So just be ready. There's going to be questions right away. You know, and I think there there are going to be mishaps. Uh, one of my co-fellows dropped a whole bunch of water right before um, <laughs> her evaluators walked in and was like actively trying to clean it up. So funny things like that happen all the time. You know, I was putting on hand sanitizer a lot. And so I'd go to shake hands and it still had that like gross, sticky feeling, which everyone knows and is is just awful. My Apple watch, which uh, I was wearing, gave me an alarm because my heart rate was so high and it was like, your heart rate's really high, but you're not working out. Like, are you having a heart attack? Uh, <laughs> like, do we need to call medical <laughs> services? So really like anything can happen. It'll be fine. Deep breaths. Like they're, they're not going to judge you for something silly like that. Yeah. If you look at the rubric, it's pretty crazy. I think it's like nine columns and three categories. Like one little thing is not going to make is, is be the end. They were really looking for safety. That's my, that's my perspective on it. That's the advice I've gotten from young and seasoned surgeons, if you will, being nice. Other advice that I had gotten, so this is sort of jumping back to documentation versus preparing for the day. When you have to label something that had a complication, I basically labeled like everything as a complication. If I did a supracondylar and my pins like migrated in a little bit, I called that a, a complication. So I think I had like a 43% complication rate mostly because, you know, supracondylar pins tend to migrate pretty frequently. If I had any concern for the wound, I called that a complication. You know, I think they get more concerned if, if you don't have any, um, and then they start kind of digging in and trying to see what you're hiding. So I was very upfront about everything that was happening with my patients, maybe yeah. too much. No, I, I actually, that's that was the advice I got too. own, own those complications, those little things. It just shows that you're discerning and that you're thoughtful. And I also think it helps with selection. I know that that's not the goal to like help them select their cases, but if you have half the cases have something, some quote unquote complication, like I had one that a wound complication popped up and it really was just a suture abscess. And then and it was otherwise a pretty simple case. So I think it's helpful just to don't hide anything. You just just kind of own everything, and it, that that goes a long way. And then the other big thing that I thought was funny, but I've continued to hear: don't argue. Defensiveness is oh, it's such a such a red flag, and I think we've all seen it. But but that is a really tough thing to do. So if you're that type that with anxiety gets a little anxious and and jumps, then that I think you got to prepare a little bit more. But that that I've heard repeatedly as. Uh, a reason that people don't, don't do well or there's question marks. 
Yeah, I think it's I think it's okay to not know something. I remember in particular, my, it was like the last case I had. It was a skiffy, and uh, the examiner asked me about like the some detail about the epiphyseal tubercle, and I hadn't read about that or didn't know about that to the degree that he was asking, at least. And so I said, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not familiar with that literature right now, but certainly something that I know I need to know going forward. So you may not know every single answer and that's okay. That's not a you know indication that you're going to fail. Just be upfront. Certainly do not try to kind of BS your way through an answer that you don't know because they uh, have done this for a long time, the examiners, and they will certainly see through that and you start putting something out there, the, the questions will keep coming. And so just be be honest if you don't know something in particular, but it's not a make or break thing. I like I like a blanked uh, intern level, like something that I 100% knew. There's no reason not to know. Like it would have totally been held against me in, in residency. And, and it felt awful while I was there, but I was like, man, I took care of this kid. I described the problem. I like I just could not remember the the name. So I, I don't think it made any effect at all. And who knows, but just keep moving through it. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, and I was going to say, I think sometimes they, they want to see just how you respond to questions. So I got questions, they were sort of on like the long-term implications of something, I think like genuvalgum. And I was like, I don't, I don't really think we, we know that answer in the literature, or I, I don't know that answer. And then, you know, talking to people after uh, who are much more knowledgeable than I uh, said, yeah, we don't we don't know that answer. Like that's not there's no research on that. Um, and so sometimes they they're really just asking you questions to see how you respond, not to not to just really kind of annoy you. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I, I just go back to just these these 12 cases are going to be with you for a year and a half. Like you're going to know them. So just know the topic, know, know the patient course and things like that, and you'll be able to work through it. I did find that some of those questions were almost entertaining in a way, like I could, like the, the they were thought provoking and anxiety provoking too, but they were not things that I hadn't thought about. So it was just one of those things where we could have a discussion about it as well. I, I forget some of the, some of the examiners are not of your specialty. So they might be just asking the question for the sake of conversation as well. So every room's a little bit different. Every examiner's a little bit different. That's just kind of, kind of how it is. I, I think I, we should uh, definitely wrap this up. I think we, I, I love the the advice and input. I think it's all hopefully going to be very helpful to everybody. I guess kind of last thoughts um, or, or kind of a last tips, if you will, from each of you, just to close things up. Yeah, I think, um, We've said a number of times, you know, I think the goal of the process is not to fail you. The goal is not to catch you. The goal is not to trick you. The goal is to really just make sure you're, you're, you know, providing thoughtful, diligent, and safe care to patients. So, you know, I think having that in the back of your mind, I think looking back, I should have been significantly less stressed uh, throughout the process because, uh, as Aaron's pointed out multiple times, you know, uh, during the podcast, you know, that's what we should be doing day to day, regardless of if we're being examined or not. So, you know, I think if you know that you're doing the best that you can, that's that's all you can do. And, you know, being stressed about, like I said, trying to get caught or tricked or something like that, I, I think that's not the purpose of the process. Um, I think that's important. I think the other thing is, you know, hearing some stories from other folks, like obviously people do fail this exam. That's, you know, very clear. They give you the data. It seems to be in back in the single digits. There are a lot of people that, you know, don't get their paperwork in on time, you know, don't properly submit their x-rays that don't properly prepare. So there are, and there are people that are, you know, probably practicing unsafe medicine. So it's not like a hundred percent of people are doing the same exact thing as you doing a great job of keeping and they have to fail 7% of people or something like that. Because I think that mindset also is, can be really stressful to think like, every single person going to that exam is going to be doing the same type of job as you are. And it's like a flip of a coin if you're one of the people that fails. So don't, don't, don't think of it that way. Think of it as, you know, they want to make sure you're, you're providing the type of care that you know you are thoughtful, diligent, and, and safe. I think that's really, really important. Like I said, reach out to, you know, other colleagues when you have questions about cases, uh, reach out to other colleagues in preparing for the tests, you know, at, you know, get get help uh, as much as you can 
And then a lot of these, I think one thing is a lot of the things that a lot of the habits that you'll form throughout this process, make sure you stick to them because they're actually pretty helpful for practice going forward, especially as your practice gets busier and busier. You're going to see a patient six months after the fact and have no idea what's going on unless you have good documentation. So I think uh, it's it's all to make us better surgeons. And I think is if you put the time and effort in, you're going to do great uh, with, the, with the process. Yeah. And I mean, things are things are going to change during, after. And so I think just going on the point of documentation, uh, so I gave birth right before we started our board collection. And so I'm happy to talk to anyone more specifically about that process of raising and newborn and also doing board collection. But because of that, they had to push back my board collection start, which initially they said they were just going to move it a month back. And then after I had submitted my cases, they told me I actually needed to move it two months back. And so these are cases I had no idea were going to be on my boards, but because I had just sort of been practicing, like every case was going to be on the board since I started, you know, in practice, it didn't make me extra nervous. So I think, you know, in in those situations, you can have a case that you do your first day of practice, but they come back and they have a complication or need a revision or whatnot. And then that case is on your boards. And so I think if you just practice like, like you should, or like every case is going to be on your boards, you'll be ready for it. Yeah. Thanks, Brad. And that, uh, Aaron, I know that was a a change and a shift to your, your timeline, which a lot of people may not know it. it kind of that policy is kind of written out on the website, but you have to kind of dig for it. So I uh, appreciate that. Well, and I had asked them ahead of time and I told them I was going to be missing two months and they're like, no, no, you just have to move it back a month. So even with sort of trying to be on top of it, sometimes you're given the wrong information, which again, you just got to roll with the punches. Love it. Well, awesome. I, I don't have really much to add. I think those kind of closing uh, remarks are perfect. I, I guess my my little my last two cents would be trust yourself and you're going to, you're going to do fine. I, I think that there's a lot of anxiety. This process is, is grueling, but in the end, I just felt like it was, it was what it was. They, they are trying to make sure you're safe. I feel, I felt like I was a safe surgeon. You, you kind of manage it as best you can, but you'll do great. And if you have questions, ask, I think that's, that's the other piece of it. So good luck to everybody. Obviously, they've already kind of shifted the timeline, so um, that's a change from when we took it, but I, I, I think the process is pretty similar. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Again, ask your seniors, ask co-residents, and, and stay on top of it. Stay prepared. So thanks for listening. Look out for the next episode of this uh, Early Surgeon Series, and have a good night.